The next item of business is the second stage of the Executive Committee Functions Bill, and I call Junior Minister Kearney to move the motion. The second stage of the bill has been moved. In accordance with the Convention, the Business Committee has not allocated any time limit on the debate. And I would call Junior Minister Kearney to open the debate on the bill. The, the purpose of the Executive Committee Functions Bill is to provide that greater, greater clarity for Ministers in relation to the circumstances in which they must refer matters to the Executive Committee for agreement. And it also provides an exemption from referral to the Executive Committee for certain decisions taken by the relevant Minister under the Planning Act of 2011. The functions of the Executive Committee are set out in Section 20 of the NI Act 1998. And these are, firstly, the functions set out in paragraphs 19 and 20 of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. The most relevant of these to the Bill before the Assembly today is that of providing a forum for the discussion of and agreement on issues which cut across the responsibilities of two or more Ministers. Secondly, the Executive Committee is also given the function of discussing and agreeing upon significant or controversial matters that are clearly outside the scope of the agreed programme referred to in paragraph 20 of strand 1 of the agreement, that is the programme for government. And these functions are also reflected in the obligation placed on ministers to bring certain matters to the executive committee under paragraph 2.4 of the ministerial code. I will now give some members some background in relation to the need for this bill. In 2017, the Department for Infrastructure, in the person of its then Permanent Secretary, took a decision to approve a planning application for the construction of a waste disposal incinerator at Molusk High Town in County Antrim, and an application for judicial review was granted by the Court. The key issue in the judicial review was whether the decision could be taken in the absence of a Minister, and the Court ruled that that could not happen. However, the judgment of the Court and the subsequent appeal by the Department, while upholding the original judgment, added further dimensions to this question. The judge also determined that this was indeed a cross-cutting issue. It involved the interest of the Minister responsible for the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs because of its specific waste management functions. And it also extended to the joint heads of government and the executive office because of the impact on compliance with EU directives. In this latter regard, the Ministerial Code states that responsibilities of the joint heads of government include EU issues. The judge also considered that the matter was both significant in view of its importance for waste management policy. It was also judged controversial because of the evident political differences reflected in the papers relating to the decision. The matter therefore failed to be considered by the Executive Committee in accordance with its function of discussing and agreeing upon significant or controversial matters that are clearly outside the scope of the agreed programme referred to in paragraph 20 of strand 1 of the agreement. The judge also said that as there was no programme for government in existence, the matter was outside the scope of such a PFG. This bill seeks to address the implications of these judgments in three main ways. Firstly, in accordance with the judgment, it will make an amendment to section 20 of the NI Act. This amendment is to make clear that a matter which is significant or controversial should be referred to the Executive Committee. If it is outside the scope of a PFG, which has been approved by the Assembly and in operation, and also in circumstances where no such programme has been approved and is therefore not in operation. That means in the absence of a PFG, for whatever reason, cannot be used as a reason for not referring a matter to the Executive Committee for decision. This is the purpose of Clause 1, Paragraph 2. In relation to the implications of the wider definition of cross-cutting, this has been interpreted as applying only to matters which cut across the statutory functions of two or more ministers. It did not encompass those in which they simply had an interest, although the matter might, as in this case, be supportive of other ministers' aims or objectives. This judgment means that the range of matters 
which would require referral to the executive could be widened substantially. With the inherent difficulty of measuring the extent and nature of the interest which another minister might well have in the matter. It could also tend to undermine the executive authority of individual ministers within their areas of responsibility. Specifically, it means that planning decisions which were considered the sole responsibility of the relevant minister and were not referred to the executive committee for agreement would help henceforth need to be so to remove the, less, the risk of legal challenge on the cross-cutting principle. This would make the Executive Committee the de facto planning authority, rather than the Minister for Infrastructure, in, in whom the statutory power is in fact vested. The Bill addresses this point by providing that a Minister does not need to refer a matter to the Executive Committee if it affects the exercise of another minister's statutory functions only incidentally. In this context, a statutory requirement for one minister to consult another is not considered as affecting the exercise of statutory responsibilities more than incidentally. Finally, to place the remit of planning decisions beyond doubt, this bill provides an exemption from referral to the executive of certain decisions made by the, the Department or Minister for Infrastructure under the 2011 Planning Act or regulations or orders made under that Act. The Bill will therefore offer much needed clarification to Ministers on the extent of their obligations to the Executive Committee, ensure that an appropriate degree of ministerial authority is preserved and finally, place reasonable limits on the extent to which ministerial decisions, including essential planning decisions, could be challenged on grounds that they are cross-cutting. Yes, Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I now call on the Chairperson of the Committee for the Executive Office, Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak on behalf of the Committee for the Executive Office. At its meeting on the 1st of July, the Committee for the Executive Office considered the general principles of the Executive Committee Functions Bill, and the First Minister and Deputy First Minister attended the meeting to answer members' questions. The Committee is aware of the judgments of the Court in the case of Buick, who successfully challenged the decision by the Department for Infrastructure to grant planning permission for the construction of a waste treatment plant and energy from waste plant at Molusk. The Committee is also aware that the Court of Appeal held that the decision to approve the application was a cross-cutting matter that required the approval of the Executive Committee. Uh, as was referenced in the debate on accelerated passage, this situation needs remedy to ensure that the Minister for Infrastructure can make planning decisions without challenge and without referral to the Executive Committee, except in particular circumstances. I think it's important to point out that this bill does not just remedy the matter in relation to planning decisions, it could also apply to other scenarios where there is an interest of more than one minister. It is also important to point out that any planning or other decision can still be brought to the Executive for consideration if three or more ministers think it is significant or controversial. The uh, junior minister has outlined in detail the general principles of the bill, but in short, it will allow the Minister for Infrastructure to make the decisions she is best placed to make without challenge and provide clarity on matters that need to be brought before the Executive Committee. The Committee noted that a number of high-profile planning applications will be coming forward for decision during the course of this year, and it is essential that any vulnerability to the integrity of the planning process is removed. The Committee for the Executive Office therefore supports the general principles of the Bill. And maybe just to highlight as well, Mr um, Deputy Speaker, that although this is a Bill and it is Accelerated Passage, the Bill has three clauses. One is the commencement date and the other is the title. So in effect there is one clause um, so the, and we did undertake a question and answer session uh, with the First and Deputy First Minister for any members for questions as well. And it is, I think, well accepted that this is a general point as to whether a decision should be taken by one minister or more than one minister. Uh, so it is a fairly uh, reasonable point, notwithstanding that the decisions that are actually taken can then be open to further scrutiny if required. 
On behalf of the SDLP, I would like to welcome this bill and the clauses contained in it. They will allow for better, speedier decision making. It removes ambiguity and will enable more openness and transparency as one minister can own a decision and if it is needed, it can be challenged. We will have some very dark and difficult economic days ahead. We will want to see some quick decisions taken, especially regarding planning, to enable swift developments that can deliver jobs. I do not want to see bad decisions. No one does, but a quick decision does not need to necessarily be a bad decision. And I feel that the construction and other key economic sectors will want to see quicker decision making that allows them to get moving much quicker. We will all want to see uh, that when the inevitable economic downturn or recession arrives after this coronavirus pandemic. I welcome this bill and support it here at its second stage. Thank you. And I call Christopher Stelford. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, the arguments in relation to the advantages of these changes have already been aired and I don't intend to repeat them. Beyond stating our support uh, for the content of the bill and the measures being brought forward by the ministers today, the chair of the committee touched upon what I think is an important point uh, and it, it was in danger of being lost in the earlier debate and that is to say that the three or more ministers' safeguard remains in place. So if ministers are upset or concerned about the implications of a decision, a cross-cutting decision, three of them is what is required to ensure that the executive as a whole is having a conversation about that decision. And I think that is important, that actually that, that safeguard does remain in, in place. The chair of the committee has said about the significant projects that are going to be required to provide an economic stimulus uh, as we come out of uh, lockdown, and I absolutely associate myself with that. I think ultimately this is a measure that's about delivering quicker governance. And I think one of the problems that we have had, and it's, it's reflective, I suppose, just of the nature of our society and the nature of our political arrangements is that it can make decision making slow and um, therefore anything that makes government quicker and more reactive to the needs that uh, confront it is only to be welcomed and on behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party we support these measures. I call Pat Sheehan. I've got uh, a last con uh, and uh, I suppose I just want to reiterate or summarise the remarks uh, I made earlier in that the Buick judgment uh, has created some problems insofar as if the infrastructure minister today were to make decisions, they could be subject to legal challenges on the basis that other ministers had an interest in that planning decision. And the example has already been given, I think, of the finance minister actually having an interest in practically every ministerial decision that's made. So it's taken bureaucracy to a ridiculous degree to suggest that um, all uh, planning decisions should go into the executive. It would slow down the decision making uh, process. It would add another layer of bureaucracy that uh, isn't needed. There are already many complaints about how slow the planning process is, and, and we don't need this. We need the infrastructure minister to be able to make decisions around planning. And all the speakers have mentioned uh, so far the importance in this current crisis and moving out of the crisis, the need to reopen the economy, to get it moving, and the infrastructure sector is an important part of all of that. So this will make the system more effective and more efficient, uh, and I welcome this bill and support it here today. Colonel I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I would declare at the outset that I was formerly a member of Ards and North Down Borough Council. Uh, by ensuring that the Infrastructure Minister has the legal authority to take planning decisions, this bill can be an important step in speeding up our planning system. But a step is all that it is, Mr. Deputy Speaker and there is so much more that needs to follow so that councils and the Department of Infrastructure can start meeting their targets for determining the outcome of planning applications as they outlined earlier. 
The overdue review of the 2011 Planning Act will be important, as will the forthcoming Northern Ireland Audit Office reports, as some members cited earlier. Both are opportunities to implement much-needed reforms, so and we can ill afford to miss those reforms. As well as changes in process, we need to understand why so many judicial reviews in Northern Ireland occur, and also why consultation periods so often exceed their specified timeframes. Where statutory consultees lack resources, this must be addressed. And where there is simply inefficiency by either, uh, in either sticking to or enforcing the deadlines, that also needs to be called out as unacceptable. And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, we can have all the reforms in the world, but it won't be enough if ministers do not have the political will to act, or dare I say, to put political interest over planning policy and plans. An independent planning authority charged with taking the politics out of planning and getting decisions made on time is something I feel should be considered as a forthcoming review of the 2011 Act. I support the bill, but request clarity when further stages will be presented to ensure that we can get the bill passed and enable decisions to be made to aid the focus of the executive in the time ahead, which must be upon managing the public health threats, but also, put simply, jobs, jobs, jobs. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Paul Free. Mr Deputy Speaker, and, and again, I rise, of course, to support uh, the bill, uh, not necessarily with regards to the extended uh, accelerated passage. I don't think that's the best way to do legislation ever. But I do see that an anomaly has arose here with regards to Buick, which needs resolved. Uh, and, and in that itself, we need to be in a position where Northern Ireland can make decisions that are sound and safe. And if this bill goes some way to allaying those fears, and making sure that Northern Ireland can make those decisions and as an executive and as an minister, then that's a good thing and that's a place where we're at at the minute shouldn't be where we're at. So we have to try and rectify that. But planning in itself worries me, Mr Deputy Speaker. We've seen council take over planning to a certain degree within our councils. But what we've found over the last number of years is a, is a patchwork being created, where there are different councils in different constituencies making different processes of decision making, which has went some way to creating confusion and twin tracks and dual speeds when it comes to planning. We have consultants and agents, planning agents, complaining that if they cover three or four council areas, they have to keep in touch and keep an eye on deadlines and schemes and schedules and registers. And it's very confusing. And even the process itself can be very confusing. And anything that brings certainty, clarity to planning would be good. Now, don't get me wrong, decisions have to be taken quickly, but they have to be taken correctly. And that is a massive point along with planning. And I fear that in the current position that we find planning in, at the council level, it's not that planning, it's not that council have taken over planning to a certain degree. It's sometimes the case that planning has taken over council. I have found in my own constituency, in the two council areas, Mid and East Antrim and Causeway Coast and Glens, it's been cited many times that Mid and East Antrim is one of the best, quickest, efficient teams of planners and planning system out there. Whereas Causeway, Coast and Glens, you could say, is the opposite. That in itself shouldn't be the case. And that needs to be resolved. Yes, I will. Yeah. Thank my colleague. Uh, and uh, obviously, he, he cites something which has been out in the public domain now for some time in terms of the comparison, not only between the two councils which are close in jurisdiction, but wider afield. And Mr Muir earlier gave us the startling statistic uh, in regards to the length of time. Indeed, I am told, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it is said by one developer uh, from outside of Northern Ireland that he wonders if there is a planning department at all, and that one individual is now considering taking his money somewhere else and putting it in another jurisdiction where they're glad to see development. And that's a very bad place for 
Blackburn and PLC. Of course it is. But my point I will come on to is this. Even though some of our councils can be classed as being very efficient, very effective and, and speedy in their decision-making process, I wonder, are they still serving best the people who they're meant to serve? And that is the agents, the applicants and the objectors. And what I have found even with all the haste in Mid East Antrim is that progressively over the last series of years and months, you used to have a planning schedule with seven or eight applications on it on a monthly basis. Now you have two or three. And if you like, I think powers that council have and have got and have sought are being diminished because they're delegating that power to the planning service. And remember, in the old style councils, the old style councillor used to be a guardian, used to be a representative, used to be somebody who fought for both applicant and agent and objector alike. And that's gone now. That representation part is gone. And that's something that I worry about going forward. And I think that councils and councillors have to take back control in many ways of our planning systems. And that's something that worries me. But we also have to ensure that the decisions that are made on a regional basis by the minister are sound and are correct and are procedurally correct. Because if they're not, well then it will only cause more stagnation and delay. And there are many massive projects that have to go ahead, that can't go ahead at this present time. And that's somewhere where we cannot be. We cannot afford to be. Because in these projects, time is of the essence, and usually time is money. Whether that be a big building contract, whether that be an infrastructure project, uh, like road network, carriageways, dueling them, uh, bypasses for our towns and some of our cities. This, this is all massive work that needs to be done. But one that's very important is the North-South Interconnector. So North-South Interconnector there will conjoin, if you like, the two systems, the two infrastructure grid systems in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Now, it's been said that for many years the North-South Interconnector was required for security of supply. I don't believe that for one moment. I believe Sony is wrong and has been wrong for many years to cite that excuse. It is not for security of supply for which we need a, an interconnector. It is to add the flexibility to our system, to inject competition into our markets. It's not about security of supply. And I always get worried when experts or so-called experts in the secure in the could in the member the return to the issue of, 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 the, of, the, of the planning minister taking regional decisions? Yes, I will, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And of course, this is one of the biggest decisions that the infrastructure minister will have to make for Northern Ireland PLC, and that is the North-South interconnector. Yes, I will. Yeah. I just want to build on the point that my colleague from North Antrim made, his colleague from North Antrim, a, moment, a few moments ago. I remember uh, an, an industrialist from Northern Ireland being interviewed a couple of years ago who said that he had decided to relocate his factory from Northern Ireland to Wales because it took so long to get the planning. That is the sort of decision that we, with the private sector cannot be forced into because of the inertia of government. Would the member agree? Would. And that is why at every, every level of planning service, at every level of government, whether it be local government or regional government, departments in the executive, they have to be in a position to make decisions soundly and quickly. And, and speed is off the essence on many of these occasions, especially in the private sector. It's, it's, it's different, if you like, for a public sector project, even though that's very, very important. So schools, infrastructure, roads, railways, all of that is very, very important. Grid, it's all very important. But for the public sector, massively so when you have people from all over this globe looking to set down a plant somewhere and assessing all their options and assessing this area and that area and realizing, well, you know, that's a prime spot. That's a really good spot. And there'll be good employment opportunities there. But you know something? The planning service are far too slow. They will not engage with me. They won't give any commitments. They won't give any commitments for support or for planning. 
and, and that is a... Yes, I will, yeah. Thank the member for giving way, and I know he wasn't in for an earlier uh, intervention that I took, but his point still stands in relation to uh, the speed in which the planning service operates. Would he agree with me that the statutory consultees, some of which he has mentioned, are the main stumbling block for progress in many of these fundamentals, whether that be on a local development or major application, which has the potential to bring much-needed jobs and employment to our constituency? Uh, I think the member for his intervention, because he hits on a very massive point. Some of these consultees treat some of these applications by, by giving a flippant response, which takes ages to come through, which then builds on delay. Now, that in itself is not the planning service's fault. It's not the infrastructure minister's fault. It's not the local government uh, planning service's fault because there is a process to be had, and if they don't follow that process, well, they could end up being challenged. And that's a massive plank in planning law at the present time. But if you have any uncertainty in that system, if you have any shred, shred of doubt in that process, well, then you will probably end up being challenged and in court. And yes, yes, I will. Yeah. The member, for, and I agree with all that he's saying in this, this debate. And can I just say to the member as well, what message does it send out to invest Northern Ireland whenever they go internationally to ask for an inward and foreign direct investment to come here uh, and then at another wing of government? Right, to address the chair so sorry, to sorry, pick up sorry. their comments. Another, another wing of government is in a position where it can't further planning uh, regulations enough, quickly enough, to, to enable that sort of investment to happen as quickly as possible and meaningful, well-paid, long-lasting jobs brought to to Northern Ireland. The same, of course, will apply in terms of tourism and the tourism infrastructure as well in, in, in relation to, to this whole issue as well, of building up the infrastructure that is needed to ensure that we get people to come here and when they come here, then invest money in, in our tourist product, which is obviously now so well known across the globe. I think the member for his interjection there. And of course, the member seeks joined up government. The member seeks a joined up executive where we're all pushing the same way, where there's a programme for government that's fit for this province. And we await, those, we await those decisions and we await those days. And of course, there shouldn't be a case if we have a programme for government and a focus, and if we have aligned our planning strategy with so many of our other strategies, then that shouldn't take place. It should not take place that one department is opposed to another, and then another make a decision on planning. And, and that's not the place where we would like to be. That's a bad place for business. If a business sees that, if the business sees that, 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 that friction within departments and a clear, no clear vision or focus, then of course they're going to go somewhere else. And of course they're going to go to that green field in another province, another art or part of the UK, or even Europe, or even the world. And that's not where we need to be. We need to have a slick, operative machine that makes sound decisions quickly and informatively. And we need that now. We need, delay is costing this country millions and it's costing this country jobs. And that's a place where we can't be. But I align back to my point about strategy. So we've been told over the last number of weeks, even in the Economy Committee, that the energy strategy is now going to be delayed further. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have moved from on the energy strategy now, we were council planning a moment ago, uh, and we were at the programme for government before that. If I didn't know better, I'd suggest there's a bit of filibustering going on uh, in, the, in the benches across the way. They might be waiting on somebody to come to the chamber, but it's certainly nothing to do with this bill. The member raised a point of order, and it's on the record. I endeavour to give some degree of flexibility. Periodically, he has mentioned regional planning issues, and when he's deviated off, I've tried to draw him back again. And I will continue to try and do my job. And I would encourage the member back to the contents of this bill. Mr. Thank, you, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And it's great to have the opportunity to speak in this House about these important issues. Uh, but, but you know something? It's all linked. It's all tied in together. There is no point having this strategy for this and a strategy for this and not being able to conjoin them together in a programme for government and then having your infrastructure minister abide by that programme for government to produce good, sound, decent planning legislation and decisions. That's what we're talking about here. That's what part of this bill is about. 
And that's why we have to make sure that this legislation passed in order to give the infrastructure minister the sound basis for which decisions can be made. And the thing is this, when we go to make planning decisions around wind farms, around grid infrastructure, surely we need to see it in a blueprint somewhere that it's actually required and actually needed. And if it's not needed, why do we pass it whenever it's going to cost Northern Ireland consumers money? Why would you pass something like that if it's going to cost us money in the long term and it's not actually required? And that brings me back to my point about the North-South Interconnector. One of the biggest single issues that the infrastructure minister will have to make, probably in this term. And yet, are we clear that the infrastructure minister has all the information that she requires and the executive requires to make this decision? And the rationale, and the right rationale for making the decision on this, whether or not Buick comes into it, whether or not this legislation comes into it, it's very important that the minister makes sound decisions. And Sony, at the present time, have said we need it for security of supply, when we do not need it for security of supply. And it's very important when a decision is made by the minister or by the local planning that the decisions are sound. And I'm not convinced, Mr Deputy Speaker, that that is the case. So I look forward to seeing this legislation go through, uh, go through its stages so that we can interrogate it more. And I, I do think that when we look at this, there may well be tweaks and turns required in the legislation. But so be it. We have to make sure we come out the other side with good quality legislation that's fit for purpose, that helps business, as my member has said, that helps infrastructure and growth in this country. Because remember, a lot of these projects, whether it be North-South Interconnector, whether it be road network or rail or buildings or business or factories or wind farms or power plants, they all create work. They, yes, yes, I will. The other issue that's very clear in terms of the planning, planning issue, and our members will have this in their own constituencies, is around the issue of the Department of Infrastructure itself and the issue of roads, and I know my colleague mentioned that earlier in the previous debate, the issue of roads and the securing of those roads being in place for the new housing development, and also the issue of the water supply and sewers. Uh, and these are issues which are, are absolutely salient in terms of the Department of Infrastructure to ensure that we can get the sort of investment we need and the planning approvals quickly through uh, both for social and private and affordable housing to ensure that those houses can be built and, and our constituents provided with the sort of housing that is needed so much in Northern Ireland. Another critical point, and that is our water and our waste sewage systems that are quite honestly antiquated at this present time. And, and, you know, there is talk about putting it on the developer, but that won't even solve the issue. Because even at the development side of an application, planning application, that will only help and sort out the pipes and the drains at that point. They will run into smaller drains that are more antiquated further down the system. Order, order, member. I would encourage you to come back to the principles of the bill rather than some of the practical long-term outworkings or planning difficulties that may exist in Northern Ireland. So the issue is the principles behind this bill. I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And yes, I agree 100% and I, I, I agree by, with your ruling that the principles of, of principles of this bill should be that in the outworking of it, that we have a system, a planning system, and a decision-making process that is both safe and sound, and that will deliver for Northern Ireland. So, yeah. I thank the member for giving way. And, and while I accept fully, and I think this House does, the need for the Department of Infrastructure and the Infrastructure Minister to have the ability to adjudicate on these decisions, given the need for, for speed, as he has mentioned, but also the quasi-judicial uh, aspect in relation to planning. But would he also accept that it is important, and it is indeed mentioned within the contents, that it is still important, and one of the concessions made and one of the altercations at the St Andrews Agreement, that cross-cutting controversial issues are still referred to the executive. Would, would he accept that that is an important aspect of this uh, bill that is indeed in order to be kept? Yes, I agree with that. And we've gone right back to the St Andrews Agreement now. So yes, uh, again, everything's threaded through everything. But, but of course, Whilst this legislation may put in place 
a power and a responsibility for one department and one minister, surely the best place for Northern Ireland is in a joined-up executive making decisions as one, with one focus and one direction going forward, being populated, those decisions being populated with a programme for government and all the other arts and parts of strategy that we have adopted over the years and have to be renewed over the coming weeks and months, the rest of this term. That is what should be then in the mindset of a minister, making a planning decision, no matter what it would be. So does it fit the criteria? Does it fit the policy? And if it does so, then yes, we should pass this or we should refuse it. That's safe, sound uh, decision-making, intelligent decision-making. It has to be done quickly and it has to be done surely. So yes, I agree with him 100%. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I've taken a lot of interventions here uh, from even the other side of the house too, uh, maybe a record, I don't know, but, but this is a very important bill. This is a very important bill for our people out there, for the people, the outworkings and the inworkings of our people and our government and our businesses. It needs to be sufficiently resourced so that decisions can be taken quickly. And that's something that we haven't been able to do of late. And I welcome the day that that will be the case. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, I support the principles of this bill. I look forward to the other stages of this bill where we can get into a debate, maybe with less interventions and interruptions. I don't know. But uh, let's look forward to that. Thank you very much. I call Jim Allister. Deputy Speaker, I will be mercifully short. And if you don't mind, Mr. Speaker, I'll address the issues of the bill. Um, I have one area of concern in respect of this bill. I think it's right that a, we should respect the principle that if you have a minister who has oversight of planning, then it's that minister who should make decisions which are within their ambit. Um, I will stray slightly to say I find it rather ironic that the minister who moved this bill was one of the first people out of the traps to welcome the Buick judgment when it was issued uh, in quashing the ARC 21 decision. But there you are, what a tangled web we weave. But the one area of concern I have is where it says in 1.8 and 1.9 that nothing in subsection 3 requires a minister to have recourse to the executive committee in relation to any matter unless that matter affects the exercise of the statutory responsibilities or one or more other ministers more than incidentally. What does more than incidentally mean? You know, this comes about in consequence of judicial review. I can think of wording, I can't, I can't think of wording more likely to provoke judicial review applications than a dispute about what something, whether something or not is more than incidental. So it's not defined in the book. Say if 1.9 sets some parameters by saying that a failure to, that the statutory responsibility to consult another is more than incidental. But that apart, there is no attempt at refining or defining, maybe because it can't be defined, uh, what is more than incidental. But I'm just cautioning that that seems to me to likely to be a vast opportunity for challenge when decisions are taken not to consult, uh, not to heed, uh, uh, not to join uh, with others in making a decision. A uh, huge area for challenge as to whether or not the role of that other was more than incidental. And I'd like to hear the other junior minister in replying uh, to give us some indication of what that terminology, terminology is meant to convey. And since this is the only practical occasion when we will debate this bill in terms of there will be no committee stage, uh, then I think it's important we get that answer. Mervyn's story. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And, and I raise uh, really because 
not as a result of what other members think uh, is the reason why I'm on my feet, but because this is an issue which I think, in terms of this House, uh, goes to, ironically, another issue which is lying in tatters uh, other, the other side of that door, and that is the credibility of this House and our ability to be able to make legislation and then having made that legislation, we actually abide by that legislation. Uh, the previous speaker uh, makes reference to the mover of the motion. And I think it does beg the question as to what declarations of interest are made in this House when members stand. Because surely if you were involved in a judicial review against a planning application, you should make a, a declaration of interest because you would have an interest in that particular matter and you had taken that matter through the courts, whether you had won or lost. And obviously, if you had been a member in a constituency that had a particular issue in relation to this very specific matter of what happened in the member's own constituency. So I do think, not for the first time in this House, from members opposite, we need the word that everybody has seemed to have on their lips in the last number of hours, clarity. So we are, I'm assuming, before this House today, having this bill in front of us to clarify and to put into legislation the outworkings of what happened in the Buick case. And that has brought us to this point in time. In terms of that particular issue, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, it raises the other element of the, this debate, and that is, and is referred to, about the recourse to the law. I think it is right that we have a legal process. I think it is right that we have a legal system whereby we can have issues addressed which are of concern. But there is a concern that we have a process in Northern Ireland, particularly in planning, where there is a very, very high dependency upon the legal process. The member for South Belfast uh, raised the query and the question earlier on uh, in the debate in regards to uh, the uh, diminution of environmental protection. It is well known now that whatever any minister in this executive, whether it be the infrastructure minister, whether it be the agriculture minister, or whether it be any other minister, brings forward legislation to try and make progress, benefit society, enhance industry, say something which is good news to our farming community, which has suffered and continues to suffer, where will we end? We'll end up in court. And if members would allow me to digress for one moment, not from the principles of the bill, but to give an example, shared environmental services. A organization that was established by the former Environment Minister. It now has a life of its own. It now seems to be able to take decisions. It tells us only in terms of the interpretation of the European uh, Habitats Directive, but it is not under the control of any minister in this executive. It is an agency. And when we have tried to find out who is the sponsoring department, we are left almost with silence. It's not infrastructure. In fact, it has been suggested to me it may be the Department for Communities may have responsibility for this organization, which happens to be based in my constituency, uh, governed uh, in terms of its function uh, by Mid and East Antrim Council. And so we have a situation, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, that when we come to this House to look at this bill, it came as a result of what happened in the courts. It came as a result of a judgment in the court. And so I think it is right that we seek to regularize that issue. 
But it has been referred to, and, and I would like the junior minister, whatever one is, the one who will uh, answer before the House this, this afternoon, to give us some understanding of the terminology in regards to the exercise of statutory responsibilities more than incidentally. I didn't have the benefit of going to school any longer than, than I felt was necessary. Uh, and that was to, I was 16 when I left and went to work to Lovell and Christmas uh, at the Givy Bacon Factory. But I, I was blessed enough to know that there are some words that are placed in documents such as we have and in legislation for a purpose. Now, while that purpose may not be explicit to those who read it, it clearly, I think, would be explicit to those who were its authors. And its draftsperson, the, the people who draft the legislation, surely would have some idea as to what was specifically meant when that was put in to the bill. And so I would welcome the fact that the minister or the junior ministers would answer that particular question when they come to the floor. My colleague and friend, Mr. Frew, and, and I, I thank him for many. There, there's a comment sometimes that says that when you come to look at a bill, maybe more to do with the, the detail of the bill as opposed to the principles of the bill, you can go from Dan to Beersheba. Well, I think he tried. Uh, and he, he tried very valiantly. I might not just get as far until the Deputy Principal Speaker brings me back to, to the principles of the bill, but he raises an issue or issues which I do think come as a result of what we are establishing here uh, in this bill uh, when it passes, if it passes uh, this House uh, to go further in its legislative process. And that is that it highlights for us the importance of the planning service and the functions of the minister who has responsibility. This House responded to public outcry. Too many councils. Let's get rid of them. Let's have 11. Let's reduce the numbers, the bureaucracy, the cost, the, du the, the duplication. I wonder how many would want to go back to the 26 councils today. When it comes to local decisions being made, we saw a report this, this week, or last week it was, from Queen's University in relation to the planning service. But of course that report was more to do with what the public perception was of those who were involved in taking the decisions. And yes, we have to have openness and transparency. I was at a meeting the other day when I had to say I was taken a bit of by when a member of the party opposite said that what we need is honesty. That's exactly what we need from the party opposite, is honesty. Honesty about a lot of things that have gone on in this little country for far too long. Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, I think that in concluding, in concluding my comments in relation to this. We need also to remind ourselves we're setting, there's always a lot of reference in this House to setting precedents. And we are setting a precedent. And we are setting down a marker in terms of the processes that we will use. And I trust that in the outworking of this piece of legislation that we will clearly look back on this day and say that was beneficial that was necessary, and that we won't look back and say, but we should have maybe done something else. And that's where I do take some degree, I, I do agree to an extent, uh, accelerated passage in any process in this House is never a, a good way to do business. It's equally not a good thing when there's an urgency to put it into a committee and then to kick it for weeks and have more information and more information and you have a whole pile of information and nobody's any the wiser after all of that information has actually been provided. So it's striking a balance in those two things. 
And I think on this one, while it's a necessity, I still would prefer the situation where we would have this in a committee being scrutinised and uh, appropriate witnesses being taken and the evidence being gathered from a wide, wide variety of sources. Because sometimes when we come to this issue, as we do many others, uh, it's the normal suspects who... Yes? On that point of accelerated passage, and, and I agree with him, uh, I don't think we really need any legislation going through. Order members, we have the debate on accelerated passage and members all express their views and cast their vote. We are past that. I bring the member back to the issue before us, the issue of the Executive Committee Functions Bill. And thank you. And uh, that was maybe a strange one where you've uh, made a ruling on an intervention, <laughs> an, an, an interventor. Uh, but can I ask the, the minister who has kindly given the intervention that, at least in a committee setting, you are able to get all interest groups and all arts and parts to have the debate about this subject and to make sure that pat legislation is clear and concise? Thank the member for giving way and not to, to uh, preempt the wrath of the Deputy Principal Speaker any longer. Uh, I, I just conclude my, my comments by saying the, uh, and I accept the point that he makes in relation to the ruling and the vote that's taken place in terms of accelerated passage. However, I think that we need to also ensure that we are cognizant of the fact that what we have done today will be important when we look back in the processes of time and say, should we have had more in terms of the detail of this bill? Because, unfortunately, I am not convinced that someone out there listening to these proceedings already has their pen on pencil ready uh, to have the, either the next application that is before a minister in court, and then that brings about delay, and delay ultimately brings about a decision that will be made by an investor to say, I've had enough, that place is not worth investing in, and it's time for me to go and put my money somewhere else. And then the same members who, with great delight, uh, have won some hollow victory will complain about no investment in their particular area. I think that is something some members in this House need to seriously reflect upon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, barely a week goes by in this chamber where I don't find myself shocked at the cavalier way in which this executive circumvents basic tests of scrutiny and accountability uh, towards governance and decision making, which most reasonable citizens would ex expect from political leaders, whether it's the budget bill uh, a few weeks ago, which was a laughing stock in terms of scrutiny and oversight, whether it's legislation carried over from Westminster, or whether it's a variety of uh, bills over housing, private tenancy, and uh, others. You don't have to be cynical, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, to conclude that the executive is using or attempting to use this crisis to ram through a range of measures which suit a decision-making process in favour of the bigger parties. This executive committee functions bill is, I'm afraid, this week's example. The basic function of this bill is to reduce scrutiny and accountability by limiting the amount of projects that must receive proper oversight by the executive uh, committee in terms of large regional and costly projects. It is quite ironic too that, it's been, um, that it is in response, direct response to the very important court case that was won by campaigners against the ARC 21 uh, incinerator. And let me be clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, people for profit oppose this incinerator. We have done so every step of the way at local council level and here uh, in Stormont. We also commend the No ARC 21 uh, campaign for their campaign over many, many years. I hope you now have a minister that is sympathetic uh, to their campaign, and I appeal to her uh, and her department to reject this project as a means of standing up for our environment. But what if we didn't or don't? <laughs> On that, no, you had enough time, plenty of time, like almost an hour. Uh, but what if we didn't or don't have a sympathetic minister? Would we seriously want to surpass committee stage uh, about such a project? Absolutely not, in my opinion. The outcome of this court case stated broadly that projects of both significant uh, and regional nature and um, projects with high costs would need to be referred to an assembly committee before being taken 
by a minister because of the way that they overlap with other departments uh, and other work agreements has been referred to already. I'm no legal expert, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, but I would suggest that legal, a legal decision such as this, taken as it was after a successful judicial review by a very progressive pro-climate campaign, should at least be given weight and listened to by this executive. Instead, this executive in my opinion, is trying to circumvent this decision uh, by somewhat passing the bill through accelerated passage that will in reality restrict this process to projects that are outside of the programme for government. I would suggest, Mr Speaker, that a, that, that a project being listed as part of the programme for government is not enough to overcome the test of committee scrutiny. Take the issue of uh, Caseman Park in my constituency, for example. Uh, if you look up uh, the word uh, cock up in a dictionary, you will likely find a picture of Caseman Park beside it. And I would suggest those at fault are primarily the upper echelons of the GAA and various storm, storm departments for their cavalier attitude towards the project for their refusal to properly engage with residents to secure a safe and suitably sized order, stadium. Order. We do not want to have a tour of significant planning decisions that members may have in each of their constituencies. We are debating the principles of the Executive Committee Functions Bill as to uh, the power that would exist in, uh, with a minister uh, in taking decisions. So I would ask the member to concentrate on that matter. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I would say a significant leeway was shown for members across the chamber. But just to conclude that point, a significant leeway, uh, to conclude that point, I think the, the clear lesson of the whole casement saga is the need for maximum scrutiny, accountability and consultation. Uh, and that uh, is relevant to that decision and the Arc 21 incinerator uh, as well. So the point I'm making, Mr Deputy Speaker, is this bill as it stands has serious implications in reducing scrutiny and accountability for a range of projects and for that reason uh, our party cannot consent to it today and it would set a dangerous present, a precedent for the future. Uh, I'll not, I'm, I'm waiting my walks there for close. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Just, I don't know about that. Um, just to conclude, this move, uh, proposed bill, smacks of Boris Johnson's build, build, build approach. And surely, if we haven't learned anything else, that we, is that we shouldn't be following Boris Johnson on the Tories on anything. Thank you. Mr Carroll's comments, he made reference to the minister, and he said that the minister would be sympathetic to the particular issue. Will, will those matters be considered, and will it be uh, ruled upon because I think that that is, is not how a minister who will have to make decisions in regards to many applications, that the perception is that somehow a minister has a particular view in regards to an issue, given the fact this has just come out of the court. <coughs> the member has made uh, an important point and he has put his views on the record. Uh, I'm not sure that I, as a Deputy Speaker, needs to make uh, a judgment upon what he has said. Nevertheless, what he said is on the record. And now I would like to invite uh, the Junior Minister, Gordon Lyons, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to thank the members who took the opportunity today to uh, contribute to the uh, debate. Um, to follow on from one of um, Mr Story's points, I, I do emphasise that it is neither the preferred nor the ordinary way of doing things for the Assembly to consider two stages of any primary legislation on the same day. It is the desire of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to provide as much time as possible for this Assembly to consider the legislation brought before it and to discharge its scrutiny rule to the, to the fullest extent. Um, but I thank members um, for, their, for their comments today. Just in uh, relation to uh, a few of them, uh, I'll begin with um, Mr McGrath um, and I welcome his support for the general principles uh, of, the, of the bill. He's absolutely right that there will be additional high profile planning uh, applications on the agenda, no doubt, in the near future. Uh, and he's absolutely right when he needs, when he say that we need an efficient uh, planning system. I know that's a, a point that's been brought up by, by a number of members here uh, today. It is absolutely essential that if we want to build our economy, if we want to have investment in infrastructure, that we have those quick and efficient uh, decisions that are made. Uh, because if you're coming into Northern Ireland and have, have money to spend, um, chances are there are people elsewhere that could have that money spent uh, in their area as well. So let's make sure we make it as easy as possible. 
um, while still keeping within all the regulations, while still making sure um, that we have a robust planning system. Uh, and that's why I agree also with what he said, uh, whenever a, a quick decision doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it is a, a bad decision. Uh, those points were then echoed by Mr Stolford uh, as well. I, I'll, I'll take his advice not to stand still uh, in South Belfast if, uh, if it's likely that something's going to get built on us uh, uh, very, very quickly. And um, I, I note that, that similar comments from, from Pashi and, uh, and from Andrew uh, Muir as well. Can I uh, apologise to Mr Muir? He previously asked uh, in the accelerated passage debate, and I'm trying not to test your patience here, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, in relation to the timetable for the rest of this bill, and that will be a decision for the Business Committee. Indeed, they may already have ruled on that uh, today. Um, Paul Frew made... Uh, a number of comments. Uh, I think it's fair to say I'm not going to refer to them all now. He did mention Mid East Antrim Borough Council and how efficient they are in their, in their planning uh, process. Uh, and I believe that an awful lot of credit uh, on that um, should go to the inaugural chair of the planning committee in Mid East Antrim now. My modesty prevents me um, from sharing uh, with the members who, who that chair uh, is. Um, but if people are, are very interested, no doubt. Um, people can, can find that out uh, for, for themselves. But again, he mentioned uh, slow um, decision making and the, the, uh, the, the consequences that, ha that that have has, and I am in agreement with, with him on that, and indeed with Mervyn, uh, Mervyn's story, who, who raised that as well. Just a comment on, on Jim Allister's uh, point. Um, I, I think it was, it's always sensible for me to defer to the members' uh, legal expertise uh, on this issue, but just uh, to say to him that the term uh, incidental here, uh, I think it is useful for me to put this on the, on the record, uh, is used to convey a meaning that a matter is not central to or does not impact on another minister's statutory authority, although it may be of interest to him or her in other ways. And the term is actually used in section six of the Northern Ireland Act concerning legislation which is only incidental or consequential on referred or accepted uh, powers. There is a precedent uh, for its use uh, as, and as a legal term it does exist. We may return to the issue of, of definition uh, at subsequent uh, stages, but of course it's not always possible uh, to be definitive uh, on that, but I hope that that answer is, is useful to, to the member. Uh, just to answer then um, Mr Carl's point. Uh, he believes that the aim of this bill is to reduce scrutiny. That's not the case. My experience, though, with Mr. Carl is that nothing that I say uh, will convince him uh, on this or on probably any other issue. But I will repeat what I had said to um, Ms. Bailey in the previous debate, which was this uh, bill does not affect the integrity of the planning process or the quality of decisions taken under it, but rather it is about who should take that uh, decision. Um, I believe um, that we have had a, a wide-ranging uh, debate. I know I haven't responded to all of the comments that people have made, um, but despite the fact that we have had the accelerated passage here today, I believe there's been ample opportunity for members to put their concerns uh, and views uh, on the record, uh, and I urge people to support the bill uh, this afternoon. Thank you. <coughs> members, the question is that the second stage of the Executive Committee function, Functions Bill be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. no. Clear the lobby. The question will be put again in three minutes.
their seats, please. <clears throat> Before I put the question, I would <coughs> again I remind members present that if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. We, we do not normally take point of orders in the, in the middle of, of uh, votes. No, no. <coughs> um, the question is that the second stage of the Executive Committee function and bill, Functions Bill be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. No. All those in favour say no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. Uh, I, we have one no, Mr Carl. I think other than that we have uh, ayes from the House. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I would ask members to take their ease just for a few moments as members may wish to return.